God's logistical grace, right? Write this at the top of your paper. It's part of your thanksgiving. Philippians 4, 6. Now, a lot of people know that verse because it's a, it's a giant verse, and a lot of people, that's one of them they memorize. Listen to what it says because it, it, it deals with my, my whole sermon, first and second hour. Listen to what he says. Be anxious for some things. Huh? It don't say that? Well, how come you accepted it so readily? <laughs> Horton said, well, I didn't. But that's the way a lot of interpret it. Don't worry about one thing. That's what that means. Do not be anxious for anything. Well, pastor, what would I do then? He tells you the antidote. Here's your medicine. In everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Isn't that a wonderful idea? What's he tell you not to do? Not to be anxious. Don't worry about what? What? <laughs> yeah. Logistical grace, God's logistical grace is the doctrine that covers this. Don't be anxious for anything. Don't be anxious. Don't worry about one thing in your life. You know why? Because God has got your life covered completely. It's called God's logistical grace. Let me show you where it's found. The first time it's found in the Bible. Let me show you. Turn to the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible. In the second chapter. Now here's what you got to know. The book of Genesis is divided into two manuscripts in Hebrew. Two manuscripts cover 50 chapters. Two manuscripts. The first manuscript was handed to Moses, and Moses wrote the, wrote the second one. The first manuscript is Genesis 1 1 through the second chapter, verse 3. The first manuscript. It's the story of creation. Actually, it's the story of the restoration of creation. We have studied that in great detail. Now, the second manuscript starts, and Moses writes, from the second chapter, verse 4, through the end of the book, is divided into 11 divisions called toledos in Hebrew. I wrote it on your paper. This is not new to those who people have been coming to church. We've talked a lot about Toledos. We're in the first Toledos, which goes from chapter 2, verse 4, to the fourth chapter, 26. That's the first Toledos. It's an important Toledos. Toledos is the idea of descendants of the human race. Genesis 2.4 begins the genealogy of the human race in the plan of God with emphasis on the lineage of Christ. Right? The first manuscript covers the entire Genesis 1-1 in the uh, original, God created the heavens and the earth, and then something happened in Genesis 1-2 that caused the earth to not be inhabitable. Verse 2, the earth is uninhabitable. That's Isaiah 45-18. So we have the restoration of the earth in verses 3, 
through the second chapter, verse 7, where we go through seven days. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Right? So by the time we get to chapter 2, verse 4, we understand creation, the restoration of creation. Agreed? Do you understand that? Okay. Well, uh, when you read it, you should be asking a thousand questions when you read the second chapter, verse 4 through 7. You ought to be asking yourself a thousand questions. Listen to what it says. This is the account, that's the word in Hebrew, toledoth. That is the word toledoth in Hebrew. The word account. Yours could be generation or descendants. That's the word toledoth. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made earth and heaven. Watch verse 5. See, he's just recapping something. He's recapping Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. He's recapping, but watch what he says. See, this is why, why you, you got to do more than read the Bible. You got to study it. Look what he says now in verse 5. Watch what he says. Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not set rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate it. You don't go like, what? How is it that you don't go, well, what? Because you just left a completed creation, right? So what is he talking about? You understand? Because he's opened up a subject that says there's no shrub. God, God said there was no shrubs. Where, where are you going to find that? Where are you going to look? Well, you go back and you understand God is teaching you something. You go back and look at, at Genesis 1 1 through the second chapter, verse 3, and you're going to find in day 3, right? Day 3, you're going to have plant life. And then day four and day five. And what is God getting ready to do? Well, listen. He's getting ready for man to inhabit the earth. Isaiah, somewhere on your paper, I typed it out. Let me see where it is. Isaiah, I don't know where I typed it out. Isaiah, it's on, it's on point two. Isaiah 45, 18, here's what it says. And he's talking about Genesis 1, 2. When the earth was covered completely in darkness, wrapped in water, and the Holy Spirit. And the earth was uninhabitable. Listen, it was tohu wabohu. <laughs> tohu wabohu, that's Hebrew. For telling you, it's not, the earth was not inhabitable for man. In Isaiah, he says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it, and He did not create it a waste place, tohu wabohu, but formed it to be inhabited. Do you understand that? So God created a heavens and earth that was perfect. Satan revolted in eternity past. And we have verse 2. God has disciplined, and that, that revolt, he has brought judgment upon Satan, and he has cast him out. He is now the angel of darkness and not the angel of light. And then God gets, gets ready, and here's what Moses is teaching, and God, God began to bring the earth so that it could be the ideal place to put mankind. Do you understand that? He created a perfect environment for a perfect man. Adam and Eve were created perfectly. It wasn't until they sinned 
that the mess grew. Yeah, then we got thorns and thistles, and then we got the earth under a curse, and man's under a curse, and yada, yada. Right? So what he's talking about is that God, listen to me, and here's, look at the top of your paper. Here is the primary point you must get. The primary point. Where did I put the primary point? The primary point. Well, here's the primary point anyhow. God prepares everything beforehand so that man, all of man's needs are being met at each stage of his life, counting the days, the month, the years, and etc. We call that principle God's logistical grace, always preparing ahead for the events of your life. I mean, did, did you come to a world? Did you come to world already in existence? Hmm? Yeah, you did. Yeah, this guy was already here. The earth is in place. When did he design it? Well, he designed it in eternity past. Ephesians one four and five. In eternity past, God designed. You know where the plan of God comes from? It comes from eternity past. At the Eternal Life Conference. Listen, you ought to pay attention to this little phrase that's used in the New Testament before the foundation of the world. It's used a lot. Before the foundation of the world. You should pay attention. What's he talking about before the foundation of the world? He's talking about God in eternity past. And there was, and listen, I just. I don't know how many studies I'm into already. I'm only in the second chapter, but I've been teaching this a long time. I've taught a lot, of, a lot of this. The point is this. You, if you want to study the Bible and get it, you've got to be consistent in your study. Listen, if you went to school the way you come to church, you'd be illiterate. And that's the way you are in the Scriptures. You're illiterate because you don't stay in a consistent pattern of study. If you did this in school, you would flunk. And listen, so many people are living a Christian life in flunking. They don't even get a D. Well, today's lesson it comes out of the second manuscript. It opens, in fact, it opens a manuscript. So I read four. We're talking about no shrubs. So, do we have shrubs today? <laughs> yeah. And guess where they come from? Well, they come from they come from day four, you know, day three, day four, then you got day five, day six. This is where this stuff comes from. And what's he teaching us? He's teaching that God has this plan ahead of time and now is bringing it to pass. We have day one, he, he corrects the darkness. We have two, he corrects the water. Day three, he's now put, getting ready to put man there. So we, he prepares all the things to make a good place for man, right? We got four, five, and six. You know, when you study creation, you have to separate the six days from each other to understand them. If you don't, you'll never understand them. So when you get into, when you get into day four, five, and six, then you you got the whole story. Then when you get to seven, the whole thing's done, right? Well, look, if you have never studied this stuff, you ought to go back to our website and, and pick it up. It'll probably take you a year to get it. And if you're hungry for the Word of God, what's it matter? Right? You should be, you should be hungry for the Word of God. So he opens up the second manuscript as if there was no first manuscript, but there was a completed heaven and earth, right? And yet he opens the second one up with there's no shrubs, no plants, and no man. And no man. Oh, look, 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 look. No shrubs in the field, verse 5, no shrubs, no plants, 
no man. No shrubs in the field of the earth, no plants. For the Lord had not sent rain upon the earth. There was no man. You see the nose? There are three no's, right? There are three no's in your Bible? Yeah, there are three no's in your Bible. That's an N-O. Made it sound like, well, your nose is in the Bible, so that's good. No, but watch. Why did you, he, listen, if he just followed the order, he said there was no, no sprout, no, no shrubs, no plants. Uh, uh, then he would, then he, then he went to day four. There's no earthly, there's no celestial things. There's no animals. There's no fish. There's no bird. You see, he went in order, right? But he didn't. He jumped. See, Day one, two, and three are separate. You need to always study them separate from four, five, and six. Because, it, listen, the reason is that when you get to day four, you have a system for counting days and months and years. You don't in day one, two, and three. We have no idea how long a period day one and two was because we don't have any system for counting it. Well, you should, I, I don't know. I've studied all this. I can't go back to it and do all this. I'm encouraged to study the Bible. I've told you nothing so far that's not in the Bible. Have I told you anything that's not in the Bible? I told you anything that's not in the Bible. Now, watch this. Watch this. In, ver in the very next verse, see, in the other verse, it says no rain. No shrub, no plant, no man, and no rain. Right? <laughs> See, I just pay attention to that stuff. Yeah? Who likes no, 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 no that much in your life? Right? So I pay attention to that stuff. I go, well, but this is a weird way to start a book that already has two chapters going. This is a, this is a strange way to open it. So, you know, curious minds want to die. I guess they do. Now, watch this. No rain, no rain. A mist comes up from the ground. Day two, we have the water separated that was around the earth are separated into water above and below the earth. And those waters above the earth and below the earth are going to be used for several things. One thing is going to be Noah's flood. If you read chapters 6 through 9, you'll see that both of those waters are used for the worldwide flood. In the meantime, you know where this mist is coming from? From the water underneath. And when next week when we come, we're going to look at the geography of the ancient world. And you're going to see a water source come out from Eden and develop continents and river sources. But the Garden of Eden is not there yet. So, but we're in the process of, of, of doing all that. You see, he's, he's, and what's the point? See, I ask my, I stand back and I go like, well, what's the point in this? What point, what is the, what doctrine is Moses trying to teach me? God takes care of man's needs. Is that not true? See, we don't, look at, there's four no's. <laughs> and God's going to, God's going to take care of all of that. He's, he's prearranged the whole thing and he just, he's just bringing it out, bringing it out bringing it out, making sure that it's just right for man. Isn't that wonderful? And his motto has never changed in the way he views you. He cares, Willie, how many hairs on your head. <laughs> Willie cut all of his hair off, and now he's got us all confused. Go, we can't count it. But God knows, God counts hairs. Okay. He and accountants, at least mine did, 
a mist used to rise up from the earth, used to, right? In the Garden of Eden. Mist used to rise up from the earth. That's a greenhouse effect. The earth had a green greenhouse effect. From the earth and the wa and wa water, the whole surface of the ground. That's what that was the source. Mist. Heavy mist. Watch verse 7. This is why we have verse 4, 5, and 6 showing us how creation worked on the benefit of mankind. Logistical grace is the message Moses is trying to teach us. Here's what he says. Then. What's he mean then? <laughs> See, that's like that word therefore. Then. Well, yeah. Once he's taken care of four, five, and six, which was uh, going back to the restoration of the earth, doing all of that for the benefit of man, which is going to come on day six, agreed? The last day of creation is going to be for man because he wants it just right for man. See, this, God wants your, listen, God has a perfect life for you. That perfect life is in his will. You will never find that perfect life apart from the will, that perfect will of God. When you find the perfect will of God, you will find your perfect life. That's logistical grace at work. So when we get to verse 7, then, then with all of, the, all of the things necessary to bring a wonderful life to the humans. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground to breathe into a nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And that is the fulfillment of Isaiah 45, 18. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it's wonderful. So, here's one. You know this phrase, for by grace are you saved through faith and not any man shall boast. You know where that's found? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Watch this. Let's go there. Let's go there. Let's look at verse 10. Because verse 10 has everything to do with our study. Now, of course, they 8 through 10. <laughs> Uh, Ephesians 2. I just quoted 8, 9. 9, not as a result of work so that no man should boast. Verse 10. For we in Christ, you know, for by grace we are saved through faith, not of yourself, it's a gift to God, yada, yada. As a result, so, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's the ultimate pur purpose that God brought humanity into the creation story. When did he plan that? Listen to me. In eternity past. Look, you got, your, you got Ephesians open? Well, look at, look at chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Look at ch chapter 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, every spiritual blessing in heaven places in Christ. How are you, you going to get all... All the blessing gifts, all the gifts of blessings that God has prepared for you in eternity past, how are you going to, and he wants to put them on earth with you. He wants all those heavenly, wonderful gifts that he has prepared for you in eternity past. He wants to give them. Your feet are on earth. That's verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, that's believers in Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. If you're in Christ, you are, if you believe the gospel, that Christ came into the world to die for your sins, was buried and raised on the third day to give you life everlasting. If you believe that, then you're in Christ. At the moment you believe that gospel, you are baptized in the church age, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. Galatians 5, of um, 3.27, you're baptized into Christ. You understand that? Yeah. And in Christ, God has got in eternity past, he has prepared a whole bunch of spiritual gifts. You talk about Christmas? My, 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 my. And he wants to bring them and give them to you while you're still on earth. Now look at this. 
if I can get my glasses working. Somehow or another, they crossed. Well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> well, just give me a moment. I don't... Yeah, but I'll make it here. Uh, whoever knew that you would have trouble with a pair of glasses? I got it, William. Thank you. What a good man. <laughs> That's got to be a first for me, I tell you. Well, apparently it won't be a last. <laughs> oh, here we are in verse 3. Blessed, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Watch verse 4. For just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. What is, what is the foundation of, before Genesis, before the creation story? Right? The whole creation story is about preparing a wonderful place on earth to put man. Then man fell through Adam's sin, and now God has to bring us into a restoration place in our life where God can flow the blessings he originally intended, but because of Adam's sin, all man fell. Wait, Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man Adam's sin entered into the world, and that sin death has been passed upon all mankind. For all have sinned in Adam. And Christ came into the world to remove that situation from us so that God could flow all of his blessings to your life. Blessings that had been prepared in eternity past in Christ. If you're in Christ, he wants to give you all of it. He wants to give you all of your Christmases before there are no more Christmases here. This is an earth deal. You understand that? I think one of the reasons my glasses do that is because I take them on and off all the time and I can't help myself. Well, I guess I could, but but I have William. <laughs> Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, and then he goes into the subject of love. See, we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. As a result of salvation, we are his workmanship. And what God wants to do is he wants to flow the spiritual blessings prepared for you in eternity past. In Christ they are. For example, eternal life is in Christ. And he, he says before he leaves in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come back. But in the meantime, I'm preparing you a place in case you come before I come. If you come before I come, I've got a place prepared for you. To, but to, therefore, to die, to die is to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord in hotel heaven. Won't cost you a thing. Price been paid. Christ on a cross. Do you realize that? Do you realize that you have that? If you don't do anything else, you, at least you got that done deal. That's a done deal. <laughs> well, I, I hope it's for you, boy. I hope it's for you. Now, here's logistical grace. Logis but here's one point of nine. I've got nine points. Of course, I'm not going to get to it. I'm out of time. Is that clock right? Huh? Is that 11? Well, oh boy. See, I was, about, I was about to go home. I thought, how is that possible? I got 27 minutes. <laughs> I got 27 minutes. Look. Here are nine doctrines on it. You ought to learn logistical grace. You know, logistical grace says God has prepared everything to give you blessings. He's prepared everything in eternity past. In Christ, if you are a believer in Christ, by that I mean you believe he died for your sins, buried and raised from the dead. That's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that's the gospel. If you believe that, God has, every day is Christmas. As far as gift giving, the greatest gift he gave is the gift of salvation. From there, he just keeps on giving. And you ought to be getting them. You ought to be getting them. 
right? He's got them for you. And where are they? They're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you got them. And you ought to be getting them. You ought to be able to see them and see the marvelous grace of God and how he, what is logistical grace? It's him providing for your needs before they are needs. You understand that? Listen, he creates needs in your life so that you have this gift coming to you to meet it. Do you understand that? God creates needs in your life so that you can turn to grace and have those needs met. There, when he meets your need, you go like, oh, I need, and not want, now need. Write this on your paper, Philippians 4.19. You know, God supply all my needs according to the riches of the glory of Christ. Supply all my needs. Listen, when you have a need, God has a need to give you more than you need. He's not going to give you more than you can handle. But he's in the taking care of the need business. But what he wants to do is to get you beyond needs. Where you're whining all the time. <laughs> Baby. He'd like to get you beyond that, knowing that that's a settled deal. I will always take care of your needs. You don't have to keep asking for it. <laughs> I got them covered. Just come with a thankful heart. I got all your needs covered. I got them. I told you I'd take care of your needs. God shall supply all your needs, right? God supply all your needs. He's told you this and he turned you back. And they're found in Christ. And not only does he want to give you your needs, he wants to bless you out of your gourd. Is that, can, can I say that? You understand that? I, I, out of your head. Yeah? And that's logistical grace. We call that in theology logistical grace. That's Philippians 4.19 in reality. God, God creates needs in your life so that he can bless you by meeting that need in such a miraculous and marvelous way. At some point, you're going to quit asking them because you don't have any needs because you know they're already met. He's already met them in a promise. He said, I will meet all your needs. Agreed? So what you do, you claim the promise, not the need. You claim the promise, not the need. You claim the promise, not the need. You claim, if, listen, if no other verse, claim Philippians 4.19 until you get more. <laughs> you see? And after a while, you don't claim needs. You claim promises. And that's a growth period in your life when you can do that. God, take care of my needs. So I claim his promise. My need's not the issue. My need is who, I, who do I turn to? Who's given me the promise in my life? Who's given me the promise in my life to take care of my needs? My husband? Maybe. For a day. What about tomorrow? Your mom and dad? I don't know. What if they have a wreck or a car accident or something? What do you mean? Who is promised to take care of your needs no matter what your circumstances? There's only one, and he's made the promise. If you, learn, if you don't learn anything else from this study, learn that. Take this paper home and study it. Because there are nine, there are nine things that are important about logistical grace that you should know. I'm only talking about one of them. <clears throat> I love what Jesus did right out of Moses. Moses introduced this idea. Jesus picked it up in Matthew 6. So let's look at Matthew 6, because now I've got about 10 minutes, I suppose. I don't know. Rick's keeping up with it for me. And... Uh, the deacons have a, a latch, and when my time goes over, they just pull it, and I fall down into the basement, and the rest of you go home. <laughs> so here we are in Matthew 6. Now, you'll be familiar with this, but you've really never studied it. But you will be familiar with it because it's popular. I'm in verse 25. Now, in this, this is a long deal. It goes from 25 to 34. If you have a study Bible, it says the cure for anxiety. <laughs> My Bible says this passage will cure anxiety. 
Huh? Isn't that good? Huh? Next time you go to the pharmacy, ask them if you could put that on, on their schedule. I have a cure for any anxiety. Anybody comes with anxiety, I've got it, and, and, and it'll be free. Would you do that for me? You think they'd take that deal? I asked one the other day, and he said no. I said, I got an absolute. <laughs> you think they thought I was nuts at public? A little bit. They wouldn't have been too far wrong. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. <laughs> Uh, he said, oh, oh, by the way, as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink or your body, as to what you should put on, is not life more than food and body, more than clothing? Right? Watch this. Look at the birds. That's a command in the Greek language. <laughs> That's a command. You know you can learn quite a bit. From birds but Jesus said let me just boil it down for you so you don't have to spend a lot of time with it look at the birds of the air now watch this they don't sow they don't reap they don't gather into barns you ever had a conversation with a bird my mother had a parakeet that was the nastiest talking bird I had ever been around in my life. I'd never been around people. I'd never, I, I worked with oil riggers for a while. That bird had a worse mouth than they did. And that bird, when a boy walked in, he would curse at him. And when a girl walked in, he'd whistle. I went, Hot, that bird is smarter than I am. A bird. So, you know, you might learn some things from birds. Uh, we never would bring our children around it because there was stuff that bird was saying, I don't want my kids to hear. Uh, wait till they get to school. They can go to Moody and get that. Look at the birds of the air. Now watch. He uses hermit, human terms for birds. They don't what? So they don't reap and they don't store stuff. Those are her, human terms that we should learn from birds. You know what that is? Who takes care of these things? If they don't have a job, and <laughs> who, who takes care of these things? If they don't sow, they don't reap, and they don't store, who's taking care of them? I mean, how do they get along? How do they make it through the week? How do they get through the month? You know, you got more month than money, right? Remember those days? Should have been in the ministry. <clears throat> right? So what's he saying? He's teaching logistical grace. With birds, he's teaching logistical grace. Right? Who takes care of the birds? Well, who created them? Well, when you go to Genesis account, we know God created them. And he created them with a need that he would meet. Who feeds the birds? Well, I'll tell you, the same guy that put them on the ark and sent them on a trip. Paid their way. Right? You know, the birds got there. That's how that parakeet, I guess, got there. They cursed like a sailor. Maybe that's why he cursed like a sailor. Then, listen, he asked a question. If the bird, if God takes care of the birds that are made after species and not after the image according to the likeness of God, who takes care of them? Then he asked a question. Watch the question he asked. Are you not more worthy? Are you not worthy much more than they? The answer is yes. Why? Because you were made in the image according to the likeness of God, and they were made after their kind, their species DNA. You know, a bird's a bird, a fish is a fish, and a dog's a dog, you know that. Of course, we don't know if they're male or female anymore, but we do know that, that what they are. And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to your life? That's what this Bible says. That's not what it says in the Greek language. And I mentioned this on your paper somewhere. I mentioned this on your paper. What it down there is, is stature. I don't even know where it is anymore. Uh, but anyhow, what it means, you can't add 
any stage of your life. You can't plan any stage of your life. Listen, the best laid plans, <laughs> right? <laughs> best laid plans. You mean, that's, an, that's an idiom, man. The best laid plans. Listen, God has your life in, in, in segments of stages of life. You know, you're a baby, you're in elementary school, you're in junior high back in my day, you're in high school, you might go to college, you go to career, you went somewhere, but they, they kicked you out of the house after you graduated from high school. Uh, that's the way I was raised. What you going to do? My senior year, everybody in the family said, what you going to do, Ron? I said, oh, I don't know. Everybody said, well, you know, you're going to get booted out. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll go to college. <laughs> Will they take care of me a little further along? And I said, no. Look, are you not more worthy? Are you not worthy? See, that's one section. In verse 27, we have another idea established. There are four sections to this, this discussion. And who of you, by being worried, can add a single, can add, add can add or change or mess with any period of your life. Your life is in episodes. Do you not know that? I'll tell you how you know. <laughs> I don't care where you are in your life. You can look back and you can see events that carried you to where you are. Good, bad, and ugly. You can't do that with the exact same thing out forward, can you? But once you get there, you can look back and you go like, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And what you should see is how God has miraculously brought you through to where you are today by his enormous, wonderful grace. That was logistical grace that brought you. He created a need. Listen, listen to me. You're going to miss this. Somebody took my clock down. Okay. All right. All right, I did quit. <laughs> I've never been a preacher paying attention to the clock. They put a clock back there and they made it big enough where I could see it and I still don't pay any attention to it. Uh, I try to, my stomach tells me when it's time to go home. That's why I don't eat anything at halftime. What's I talking about? No. <laughs> you can't add anything to your life. You can't add anything to your life. Just except where, listen, you know how to figure out how you're going to go the next 30 years? Connect up with God. Because it was God who brought you through to get you where you are. Just pay attention to God. He'll, he'll take you the rest of the way on. Just pay attention to God. Listen, what I don't want you to miss, logistical grace is not going to take just care of your needs. He wants to shower. What's that song? Blessings from heaven. How's that go, Rick? Do it again, Lynn. Showers of blessings. I forget how that goes. I had it in my head for a moment, and that's what happens when you get further down the road. Here's verse 28. And why are you worried about clothing? You know, how you look. Observe. There's another command. Observe how the lilies of the field grow. Now he, he, he's got you off of birds and onto flowers. What are the lessons we could learn from flowers? He, he says, well, here's what, here it is. They don't toil, nor do they spin. You know, spinning is to develop the clothes you wear. They don't toil to get the material, and they don't spin the material into clothing to, for you to wear, Right? Who takes care of that? Who does all that? See, that's human terms. Who takes care of all that stuff? God. Those are kind of needs, right? They're the, the needs. And, and so who takes care of all that? Listen, the one who promised. Listen, you don't, you don't have to hold on to your need. You need to hold on to your what? Hold on to your... It's not your need you have to hold on to. It's your what? Promise. Faith is how you get it. Do it. 
But you got to have the promise. Who promised you that he would pay your rent? Who promised you? You see what I mean? Well, I've been promised they would pay it. God honors his promise. He has promised. Your need, you hold on to your need, it's nothing. God has created a need in your life so you could turn to him and see the miraculous, marvelous grace of your heavenly Father who has promised to take care of you until death. Agreed? And beyond. That's called logistical grace. That's Philippians 4.19, among many other passages on that piece of paper. So we have 28. We have 28. Verse 29, he goes on with that idea of flowers. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. You see, toil and spin and clothe. You see the idea? Verse 30, but if God, that's a first, that, that's a first class condition. For if God so clothed the grass of the field, and he did, now we, now we got grass of the field, you know, where you put cows and goats and sheep, I guess. We, we put cows as a kid. So if God so clothed the grass of the field, and he did, my grandfather was an old farmer. He come to visit me many years ago. I've told this story before, but he come to visit me. I said, hey, Grandpa, come on with me. I got to go down to the store and pick up some fertilizer. So we did. I picked up three bags of manure. And my grandfather said, whoa, 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 whoa. what is that you're getting? I said, manure. He said, they bag manure? And you're paying for it? <laughs> and I went, Wow. <laughs> I used to shovel that stuff, man. And my grandfather was shocked that we would actually go out and buy bags of it and bring it home. He said, man, I could have made a fortune if I'd have known people would buy them. <laughs> I'd had more cows than you could imagine. Well, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, in other words, it has a short lifespan, will he not much more clothe you, you have little faith. See, it tells you the problem. See, if you hang on to the need without handing on the problem, see, your need, you're looking at all the wrong places for all the wrong reasons. But if you hold on to the promise, because he's promised he'd take care of your need, so you don't have to hold on to the need. What you have to hold on is the promise and hold on to the one who's promised it. You know what, and, and Horton was right. You know what, what's required to do that? Faith. It requires faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Hold on to the promise because when you hold on to the promise, you're holding on to the promise keeper. And you hold on. Until he meets that need, you hold on by faith, not by sight. When sight comes, it's not even an issue. The issue is how faithful God is to what he's promised me. The character of God, I call it God showing up and showing out. Well, here we are in 31, this is our fourth section. Do not worry then, saying... What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we be clothed? See, the word what are markers. You spend too much time, we all do, on the what's and not the who. We spend too much time on the details of life and not on the source of it. I'm going to encourage you. Turn loose of your need. Identify it. Turn loose of it and hold on to the promise. Because when you do, you got the promise keeper. 
and he will show up and he will show out and he will touch your heart in ways that meeting the need any other way could not do it. Having that need met any other way could not do it. But when you turn that over, it don't matter how it's met, it will just overwhelm your soul. Verse 32. For the Gentiles, unbelievers' idea. For the Gentile, unbelievers eagerly seek all these things. They eagerly seek them. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. You understand? He knows you have needs because he's created them for you to turn to him and watch his marvelous grace meet all that need. Can worry? Listen, here's his theme. It's used over and over and over again. You know what's used over and over again as a marker? Do not worry. Do not be anxious. When you find, you find yourself doing that, you're holding on to a need and not on to a promise. Tell me you got it. And what it does, it puts, it puts an inner peace in you. Look, it, it's, it's, that's taken care of. Again, I'll tell you how many times. Uh, just in the recent days of my life, the last couple of years, that this has been a major theme in my life. A major theme. So he says, so let me conclude. Verse 33, 34. So he says, let me wrap this thing up for you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to your life. You know what they become, Willie? They become your great testimony. Whether you tell it or people see it. Sometimes they, they read your life like a book. You don't have to tell them your book. They read your life. Logistical grace, it's called logistical grace in theology. It's one of the most marvelous things you could ever grasp a hold of. I want you to have that in Moody. This is why I pray about every day in my life. That you would come to the knowledge of what God has promised you in the word and you would find that promise and hold to these promises where God will do marvelous and great things in your life. He will do things in your marriage. He will do things in your business. He, listen, he wants a light in your marriage. He wants a light in your family. He wants a light in your business. He wants a light in your church. He wants a light in your community, and you're it. <laughs> and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing because everybody else is in darkness. And listen how he closes. So... Let's wrap it up, he says. So, do not worry about tomorrow. <laughs> do not worry about tomorrow. Listen, where's your need? In the, in the big scheme of days and points, where's your need? Right now. Right now. In the present, right? Right? I mean, nobody talks about a need that was 12 years ago, unless they've got a lump on their shoulders. What you should learn for tomorrow is how God handled today. Agreed? Come on. I've spent enough time with you here right here to pound an idea. Have I that? Listen, he didn't say what was that. Listen, I, I've covered today. How are you going to take care of your needs today? Am I going to hold on to my need or my what? I'm going to hold on to my promise, ain't it? Because the one that I'm holding on to is God, who is the promise keeper. And what I learned from that, when God shows up and shows out, carries my tomorrows. What am I going to do tomorrow? I'm going to do the same thing I did today. <laughs> do you see that? He says, so then, don't worry about tomorrow. 
Tomorrow will care for itself. Boy, that's one we ought to put on our refrigerator, shouldn't we? Each day. See, we're talking about tomorrows. Each day whether we're talking about yesterday, today, or tomorrow, the principle is that each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> Just because you got rid of one doesn't mean you got to have another. What you're learning is that God provides in the most miraculous ways on your life. Oh, well, he'd probably do that for other people, Ron, but I don't think he'd do it for me. Listen, are you born again? Are you born again? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day? Then you're saved. And he wants to put a testimony in your heart about the faithfulness of God. Not the unfaithfulness of man, but the faithfulness of God. <laughs> well, I, have a, I can feel the trap door moving. I'm going to wrap this baby up. You should take that paper and read. I said there were nine points for you to identify and look at. I pulled them out for each kind of look. I only looked at two or three of them uh, that I thought would be big, big ones. All right? Do not fear. There you go. Well, aren't you something? <laughs> Now take that for take that over to anxiety and we'll have a setting. Take that same idea over. Yeah. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way. For those who visit with us in Moody. If they're looking for a church home to teach the Bible, we always give doggy bags because we know we always give more than you can handle at one meal, but Maybe later in the afternoon or maybe tomorrow or maybe Tuesday, you pull that, pull that sheet out and you study it and you go like, hmm, that, that, that's still good food. I can eat it. I pray that, Father. I pray that. I pray that we would come to understand what an enormous doctrine logistic, God's logistical grace is and how Moses opened it up and showed it to us and Jesus picked it up out of the creation story just like Moses did. He picked it out of the creation story and brought it home to us. And we're so thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen.